and our first parade in the arena this morning here in the main arena is the parade of motorcycles. The Netley Marsh Motorcycle Parade is a little bit different perhaps to the motorcycle parade you're used to elsewhere. We don't get involved in a technical long stuff before common three on the motorbike. In fact, we try to avoid that on all the exhibits, really. We like to see movement in the arena. We like to give people a show they can watch. We don't like to bore people to add a show that. So please talk to the exhibitors. Good times to catch the exhibitors are when they're taking their exhibits back to the Areas. So just follow them back and you can catch them there. If you want to know what pounds per square inch the oil pressure ought to be on anything specifically, well, go back and check that person. You talk to them. They'd love to tell you about that. The motorcycle parade takes the ball of a big fly pipe here, and you'll see that in operation shortly in the arena.
main thing is to get the equipment that they're carrying to the right place at the right time. What we're trying to do, doesn't look to me as if he's got a wide angle lens on, he's panning round, but we're trying to see how if we can get all this in. Yeah, I know the object of the exercise was to try and get it in one frame, but I don't think you'll do it. Well, leading our commercial vehicles in today, we have some of, some of the vehicles from the military display. As far as the British military vehicles went, they were very, very much based on standard commercial vehicles. However, as the Second World War continued, we needed vehicles with all-wheel drive capability, which we were pretty sadly lacking, actually, in the the manufacturing capability of these vehicles. And it was vehicles like this that largely were imported from America. But leading the parade is a post-war vehicle. And it's got to be post-war because it's a Land Rover. And there was no such thing as a Land Rover in the war. In the Second World War, the Jeep suddenly arrived. The Jeep, which actually did have input from BSA right back in its roots, but uh, the, uh, the Bantam Car Company uh, moved on through to Willis and Ford who produced all the news. But here we have a uh, series of two ideas in. So this was a little bit into Land Rover production, but now we're back to the Second World War era with the GMC, General Motor Corporation, 6x6, six six, a rough, reliable, rugged vehicle that came through in many formats, soft skin, hard skin, office bodies, ambulance, anything you can imagine. They actually uh, worked for the, the GM4 period now. We're back to the Land Rover, but if you look at it, the Land Rover is the short wheel base. There's a lot of bits missing. It's been chopped up, the body works differently. The actual fact is a lot less metal on it. This is because these vehicles were designed to be freighted, completely knocked down or packed flat. Uh, and then perhaps parachuted even on collapsible pallets from uh, the, the aircraft. These were air portable Land Rovers. But right back before that was the Series 1. And here we have probably the earliest Land Rover here today, just going past the commentary point. Now you look at those lights behind the, the radiator grill in the front. So we're looking at around about 1950-51, somewhere like that. 1951, thank you very much. And it's the Series 1 Land Rover, Mr. Martin Richter from Hawthorne, down in the forest. Lovely little vehicle that was. Ultra short wheelbase, exactly the same wheelbase as the World War II Jeep. Now going past is, yes it's a commercial vehicle, it's a tipper, it's a little dumper. And it's the Wingate Muir Hill there, a little single cylinder dumper. You started it by turning the handle round, or if you were really clever, you started it by parking it in front of the bulldozer that gave you a shove in the morning. Uh, if you're on a big building. And uh, if you look at it, you'll notice that the big difference is with the, the Matador Mark II from 1937. If you look at the front of the cab as it goes past you, there's a, a rounded black box that sticks out behind the indicator on the front of the cab, above the side lamp. There's this funny rounded black box with tubes. That's the fuel supply system, it's the fuel lifting system, the auto vac that brought the fuel up from the engine. And now the splendid example here, the Export Corporation double deck tree, the AEC region tree from 1951. It's the nine and a half litre AEC straight six diesel engine in this one. And uh, it's uh, brought to us today by uh, Bumstead <laughs> from uh, from from Southampton here. Lovely example there. It's under restoration at the moment. Needs a little bit of paint for it. Now, not quite the Southampton football team on board, but um, probably trainees. This bus was actually used. The open topper, which is going past, uh, it was the, the seafront tours of Southampton. Yes, there is a seafront. There's the docks and all the rest of it. Quite a, an attraction at one time. And this is an original Southampton Corporation bus, 
is the Guy Aaron. Not a six-cylinder diesel engine, it's a five-cylinder diesel engine, it's a five-cylinder guy in this one. And now this AEC again, back to the AEC, Bob Smith from Windsor, and that's Windsor Southampton. It's the AEC Mercury from 1961. Um, beautifully presented, very, very reliable, nice vehicle. And if you'd like to buy a commercial vehicle, well, it's up for sale this weekend. This is the type of vehicle that anyone, if you've got space to buy it, and you want a commercial vehicle to bring to the show, then this would be an ideal choice to start because we've got a very, very reliable, sturdy vehicle to start with. And then number 35, and a little bit of our local history here. Uh, well, local history inside the cap as well, because Tom Coates has been around for a while, and he's uh, many, many times before. It's a beautiful example of local history there. Uh, on the, the Albion brought to us by John Coates today from, from, from Dorset. Still some local history, the Austin, the Austin LD, and this is the one ton carrying capacity LD. It's the uh, property of Peter Lowe. He had it in his hardware shop, it's a 1963 model. Had it in his hardware shop down at uh, Top on the A31. Used it for household delivery. When he retired, he kept the van and the father of Tommy Pete It's a lovely to see this vehicle just the way it was when it was working. And those interesting histories here with these two vehicles coming down towards us in uh, Wallace's delivery. This is actually worked in the London area, this particular one, uh, around Epsom. <laughs> and then went on for agricultural grain freight up in Oxfordshire and was bodied up and used for tipping purposes after the war. There was so much work needed for these vehicles. And now for 1963, the AEC Mercury in the same livery. And uh, once again, the six-cylinder AEC, the reliable six-cylinder AEC engine. It went right up to 11 litres in various forms. Of course, this one was a bit smaller. Now we're looking down at the 28 horsepower petrol again, from the very early 1950s, and it's a bit of case area. Nicely presented, beautifully restored in the vehicle. Two drop charts on. It only carried one and a half tons, but that was plenty in those days. 28 horsepower engine, joy to drive petrol engine. And now the comma, uh, the Wobble family, one of our local exhibitors again, from uh, brought us this particular engine which uh, was in use up in Cumbria. You see it's not red all over, it's got this aluminium scratch coating on there and the scratch coating aluminium uh, is so it could drive up narrow lanes without getting all the red paint torn up, which is a lot of that sort of thing in Cumbria. And now, from the Isle of Wight, yes, it actually fits on the Isle of Wight, this one. There's not a lot of room left for anything else when it gets over there with a trailer on. But it comes across to Netley Marsh and it brings a steam engine with it as well. So it's great to see this Kenworth. And this is haulage American style. The little square box behind the cab is the driver's accommodation. This living pod there on the back. Now if you wanted a Land Rover you could see over hedges with. This is the ideal piece of kit. It's designed for wading about in water, really. And uh, it's one of a very small number that was actually produced, but it's great to see this one in preservation. Ducks would may have had a hand in this one. Nice example there of the Land Rover, the track Land Rover. Another example now of the Land Rover. Very, very original to look at about the only little extra bit on this one that you see going past the hard top is the uh, three-wheel drive hubs on there. Oh, it's another special delivery arriving at the country box. It's no use, Brian. You'll have to train him how to get in and out of the cab. Yeah, <laughs> 
And that's the, the Red Cross parcel brought over for the, for the commentary box. And uh, this is a working generator truck. It's come down from the Midlands. It's working because on many showgrounds it's actually powering uh, a large fairground also. And we do have, apart from the change in venue for the church service today, which I've already announced, there is also a change in the program, the advertised program. We are unable to bring you the parachutists this afternoon. This is due to wind conditions, high level wind conditions, and we've been advised that they have been told that they cannot make the drop this afternoon. So we will be uh, unable to use the parachutes as part of our arena for a uh, display this afternoon, but the arena show will continue. We've got plenty, of, plenty of ways of filling the time in, believe me. There will be no parachutes this afternoon. I'm sorry if you've come specially to see the parachute drop, but uh, one of those things, weather permitting very much, and we've been advised by the parachute team themselves that they've been instructed that it is not safe on the high level wind conditions for them to actually make the drop. And now forming our line up across the arena, we have our steam engines here for the weekend. Not all the steamers will be out here today because some are out in the working area. They've been working away steadily through the weekend. 
Don't forget the show is not just in one one field here at the top, there's also a working field under the Just going past the culinary point now, you see there's the power roller which is going past it. And this doesn't have a roof on it, does it? But if you wanted a top on a steam engine when you ordered one, a steam locomotive of any kind, whether it was a road locomotive or a roller, you had to stipulate that you, or if you ordered the top separately and to your dimensions too, depending on where you were using it. Which is the railway arches where it's no transport on there by to use these roads. The maximum height of motorway bridges certainly did not apply in those days. The minimum height of those regulations for motorway bridges, it didn't apply in those days. Just walking across the top of the ring. What's the recipe today? Does all these people want to know if they're invited for a meal later? They'll find out what he's cooking. Hang on. Well, well, uh, Malcolm's going to interview Fanny Frederick here, and we'll find out what's going on. Yeah. 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 And yet another Garrett Chauvin's engine here now coming past the commentary point, that's the Rambler. It's not a format that I suppose everyone assumes the steam engine will look like. When, when you mention potatoes, again, fresh produce from the garden, placed in the smoke box uh, to be cooked later on for tea. So all of you on this side, if you want to go and find where he is, <laughs> you're invited for tea later on. <laughs> So uh, the road snap's got rosemary and everything else uh, all impregnated in it, ready to go. So keep your eye on that, didn't uh. Anyway, John, back to the mundane stuff for you now. I've done the cookery lesson. Oh, well, it's not too mundane, is it? Ah, uh, it's all right. We're getting it.
And one question only for you. Are you all willing to come back with me to the year 1376? Come, come, I know you can all do so much better. So I'm going to ask you one more time. Oh, very, very close there. Just a bit away. Here comes Wallace. Oh, oh, he came very, very close. He just couldn't keep that head on. But they will get a second attempt here. Oh, very, very close once more by Lady Thomas Colville there. Unlucky. Oh, my, my, my. No points at all just yet. There we go, the young man managed it. There's a point there for him. And again, they will also get a second attempt here. Just get one done. Here goes Count Adamar. Yes, let's go. Oh, it's oh and again, no joy at all there. Clearly frustrating. And, not, and just to prove a point, here they go. Oh, and a fantastic strike there by Adamar. He's broken his lance. And he seems good to go once more. Oh, come, come, my lord. Remember, this is a contact sport. Here they go. Oh, come, come, my lord. This is a contact sport, remember? Now 
the full section on parking. Front hydraulic. And uh, now a little muff hill. A little bit of a smaller track, but you can still on the muff hill. The muff hill is coming towards the end of the muff hill to that to the right hill in here. Before I went over to the end of the two chapter. Of course, this is the very comfortable place now, up here doing the very high way to go, but up here in any form in 1951. Then all this land, still brought the county to some areas on the area, took 10 years to restore it, and one of the most popular sessions today, and all the people working with the sessions today, not very far from the sessions, we were in charge of the land being made by Stan Rupert's and the same for the story of Boston, Another example of a slightly earlier day was 
David Foster from Yellow in the red there. David Brown, nine fifty nine fifty one. Then he was scored by the time and then the red one is the red. Number forty eight now, and this is the third of the two degrees from him. Nineteen forty seven. Most of the great goals of speed there. Initially two thousand and six. Not powered by the standard engine this one, but this one's powered by the American engine. Which is not the car. So it's working today, you know, when it's not the other engine from New Zealand and the other car.
entrances to the arena. Now if you notice the final steamer to make it into the arena so far is now in the lead. This is because the Central is geared up to be a fast motor out on the road, whereas these other steam engines actually were. And that's the Super Central from 1930. And it's only it's based here in Hampshire, just down the road in Gospel. And now just going past the commentary point, it's the Burrow, and this is Elizabeth, uh, owned by Don Cully. No Queen Victoria just going past us now, not literally, but uh, it's the name of the year, the riding club. And this is always a, a treat to see in this engine. It's a convertible. They were fewer than the engines that were either built as this or as that or as another type of locomotive. But the compressor was designed to be a made of all work. Although 
it has to be said that Adrian built probably some of the largest rollers in the world from one time to another. One of them in particular went across to the USA where it was working in New York. And we're having able we're having rollers in a rollers in a row now. you don't see anymore. You don't see hot tarmac going down, you don't see the tarmac gangs working out on the road. All this health and safety business, they reckon you mustn't work with hot stuff. Well, I've enjoyed a lot of times with hot stuff from one time to another, but the tarmac's another story. There goes Moby Dick. The Avery Porter Blue over there. Cultural engine that uh, Neil just quickening the line up now. That's an old check. I think that's the only old thing that we have here at Netley this weekend. And coming past the Coventry point there, number nine. Owned by Nick Mills of our, and this is one of our, once again, another regular down here on the end. Spent its original working life in London. And it was still working still maintained its place on the working fleet right up until 1964 and this roller dates right the way back to 1926 and she was still classed as a working machine right up until uh, 1964. That a little Tasker's tractor is just going past us now. Lovely little road tractor this one. Tasker, of course, built in Andover, just up the road from us here. And there we are. We had three principal steam engine builders here in Hampshire. Tasker, Wallace and Stephen. Thornycroft, yes, they do steam. That was the first of the garret. That's Katrina going past this land. Little engine in showman specification there. It's had a long history, this one. Worked up in the middle, based in Worcester for a while. Max family, the only the second owner and his third owner from you, just time to go on major boiler repair. We haven't seen it for a little while because on the last five years it's been in for a complete refit. It's wonderful to see it back out again. And this is the first of our Wallace and Stevens rolling and uh, he's in the suffering. Built down there locally here in Bayview State. Oh, well, then, this is another garret that we've seen very frequently down here at Netley. Built in 1910. It's had one or two different crew members. 
when the law was changed and they allowed you to operate the steam engine with one person, Wallace and Stevens came up to the set of drawings almost straight away to enable them to make these small engines. They'd already been making relatively small rollers, so they had half the job. The showground engine, the showman's locomotive, we're so fortunate to have several examples of here. Probably the type of steam engine everybody thinks of. But just look at all on the line up now, it's simply an indication that in fact the showman's locomotives were only the tip of the iceberg. In fact, quite often you didn't see the showman's locomotives on the road because showmen will be moving around at night. Just gone past us now, the Bowden steam tractor. Bowden's built specialist tractors, heavy hauling tractors, timber tractors, anything you wanted Bowden's to build. They built a half track steam engine at one time. Here we have a Bowden steam wagon, which is a Bowden tanker. This particular one dates from 1929, the green tanker has gone through. See it on pneumatic tyres. Well, this would have been converted in 1930, or just after 1930, to go on to pneumatics, because in 1929 it would have been produced on solid wheels. Solid tyres, you could do 12 miles an hour, the difference in the world. And there you see a, a roller, very much in the way that you would see in a working roller, just on past his neck. Another boat making his way to us, this is the boat and wagon. And in fact, these wagons from three, five, seven tons. Some of them are different. King's down at the This is Lydia and his double jet ran a fleet of a nice example here, beautifully restored, presented the little lady. And that's a typical tractor, as you see here, a frozen timber tractor, ideal for which for all its purposes as well. Our miniature phone, 2% from 1930, there in the lineup. Well, there's the sentinel steam wagon that you have here. Yes, they've never called them lorries. It looks like a lorry, doesn't it? The sentinels always know, always turn these steam wagons. Beautiful example there. Very well presented. Central will continue producing and closing the same work together on the same production line. The last Central steamers went down to Argentina, the last ship of the steamers that was actually built. Down to the miniatures again now. Well that carries you back to the gearing by the rods on the top. Underneath, in the boiler, is where the kettle boils, the water's boiled, and back at the cockpit end, the fire is that keeps it all boiling. It produces the steam, it produces the power in the ship to drive the pistons in the cylinder. Because the exhaust pipe of a sentinel, the chimney of a sentinel, comes straight up through the cab, and if you look directly below the chimney, the sentinel here in the front line, number one in your program, it's got the number one number dangling on the front of it there. You can see the boiler, the bottom of the boiler is pointing straight down at the ground. This is an upright boiler, not so common, although there were three or four companies that manufactured steelers in this country with the upright boilers. Cornicross, Mad, 
this really was the marine star boiler, the type of boiler that you would have found on steam boats or steam launches. The, that's the vertical boiler. The horizontal boilers are the type of which you can see so beautifully illustrated here on the miniatures as they're going past you. All the way down, because in front there, there's boiler tubes. And the tubes go through, the, the tubes that you don't get heat through the boiling water. And you need to clean those tubes just waffling on about steam engines generally. They don't want to run short of water when the water is in the wrong place in the boiler. Each one of these engines needs to be topped up with water regularly. It's not always possible to maintain them all at the same level.